Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that it's a new beginning. Thank you that you are turning things around. Thank you that you are changing who we are and what's happening. This doesn't look like what we usually do for church. And I thank you that we don't have to fit some moldy format of what we're supposed to look like, what we're supposed to do, and how formal we're supposed to be. So, Lord, I just thank you that you are such a magnificent God. So, what's going on? I mean, you know, things are changing. There's so many teachings about end times and the days of Elijah. And Kim Clement wrote a song about it. These are the days of Elijah, right? Well, it's been out for 10 years, but, you know, <laughs> these are the days. And uh, we sing it in church. We know that the word is multifaceted, right? Because it means so many different things that we have to apply to what we're doing. So if <laughs> It really, if we really do that, then what were the days of Elijah like? Because if these are the days of Elijah, we need to pay attention, right? And so how can we understand the anointing of Elijah or the importance of the mantle of Elijah if we don't even understand the times he ministered in? Because um, I've wondered about this for a long time now. If these are the days of Elijah... And that means that we're supposed to be walking in that same anointing and then increasing the anointing of the days of Elijah. And I mean, he was pretty powerful, you know. I mean, like bones from the dead, you know, all kinds of stuff. And so if we did all that, then what's going on today? I mean, because we're supposed to do more than Jesus did. Jesus did more than Elijah did. And if these are the days of Elijah, then we should that should be like our base, right? So I'm trying to figure all this out. And didn't Jesus tell us to watch the signs in the times? So, I'm watching. we got hurricanes, we got water, we got floods, we got earthquakes, we got government corruption, we got all kinds of stuff going on. There's lots of signs. Okay? So, let's go back to Elijah's time and see what his times look like. So, for a hundred years, God's people had prospered when Elijah came along. Saul, David, and Solomon all had issues with sin. And we know that everybody has issues with sin, right? I read a thing today and it said, my view of heaven, this man said, my view of heaven is um, being in a place where there's no sin. Because I feel like all my troubles result from, are re a result from sin. And I thought, okay. Yeah, kind of. My idea of heaven is being in the absolute, magnificent, glorious presence of God that overshadows anything else, and I don't care about anything else. I just want to be there with him. But it made me think a lot about how much sin affects people. And so David, Saul, and Solomon all had issues. They had failures, they had sin, and but it was a glorious time for the Jews. They... Uh, if you jump forward then to the movement of the Holy Spirit in the 1900, starting in 1900 in America, uh, the movement in Kansas for intercession and spiritual warfare, this movement was started in Topeka, Kansas. It was a Bible school led by a former Methodist pastor named Charles Fox Parnum. One night, December 31st, 1900, so they're going to turn over to the thing, he was just in prayer. And uh, this lady named Agnes Osmond, so here's Agnes in this prayer meeting, right, because they're bringing in a new century. And she says, I want you guys to, to pray for me. I want everyone to lay their hands and pray for me. I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. And she wanted the tongues because it was evidence of the Holy Spirit, right? But this is not a common thing. I mean, we just, we just talk about it all the time. You know, you get born again, then you get spirit-filled, gives you that extra power. You pray in tongues, it makes your spirit man grow, according to Jude 20. This was rare then. So this is what was going on. And when she asked for that, she started speaking Chinese, and she was unable to speak English for three days. <laughs> That's huge. Yes. That's huge. And um, when they tied speaking in tongues to the t baptism of the Holy Spirit, they weren't even really sure. They knew it said it was evidence of, but they weren't even sure what that really meant. But when they did all that, the Pentecostal movement started right then, 1900, overnight. And that's when intercession, spiritual warfare, and all that began to grow. 
So since that time, the Christians have flourished compared to the times before, since the death of Christ. So very similar to what happened in Elijah's times, where the Jews were flourishing, the Christians have flourished. And um, what happened in that movement, in that first Pentecostal movement, was tongues, healing, casting out of demons, prophecy, gifts of the Spirit, all of this began to get manifested in the kingdom. And people heard about it. It's not like there was internet back then, you know. I mean, it was, you know, stagecoaches. But people heard about it, and as they heard, people began to travel to Tokyo. People still go there today to go to Parnum's house to see if there's any anointing left that they can get. I know because that friends with them. From there, it spread down into Houston, and where uh, there was a black man named William Joseph Seymour. And he was an African-American holiness pastor who was blind in one eye. Right? So not a, not a lot of potential there in the natural. But what happened was that Holy Spirit in 1906, he, or right before 1906, he, he heard about Parnum, he saw Parnum, he received the Holy Spirit, and it was with such power that in 1906, he went to L.A. to a tryout to be a pastor. Well, as soon as they spoke, they kicked him out. They didn't even let him finish the service. And they certainly didn't let him come back for the second part. So he decided, well, God called me here and he called me to be a pastor. So he moved about two blocks away and Azusa Street was born. And the Azusa Street ministry came because of him. It was called the Second Blessing and they spent months in prayer for it to fall. Um, but it was the, one of the first interracial churches. It became so large that they had to buy a, an old Methodist church on Azusa Street. And they had daily meetings for three solid years. How long did Jesus preach? Big number. <clears throat> Big number three. So the resulting Pentecostal movement and later the charismatic movement both exploded worldwide in the 20th century. All of them can trace their roots back to these two revivals. All of them. From there, he went from uh, Azusa Street, the movement spread all over the earth. You guys have all heard of, um, what's her name? Amy Simple McPherson. She was very dramatic. She did arts. She did plays. They took bands out on the street. Nobody ever did this in the church. You had to go to church and invest in most finest clothes. And you would go in and you would sit quietly while somebody told you what you were supposed to think, and then you went home. And that was church up till that time. She took it to the theater. She invaded the entertainment industry. She did, she was so dramatic, she made Catherine Kuhlman dull. And she was just dramatic in what she did. And hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands got saved. And the Azusa Street Ministry, they sent out thousands of missionaries. They went out all around the world. And the charismatic movement came because of this founding. All of it started with a prayer meeting. It all started with a prayer meeting. But over the earth, this movement has been... We talk about how the Christians aren't doing what they're supposed to. They need to raise up. They need to do this. They need to do that. And they and, and, and there's all this critical talk about Christians, right? But we're in a better position now than we've ever been. We are, we are really living in glory days, and they're increasing. And we're seeing more and more persecution. But you know what? Count it all joy. Because it, and we say that really easily. But Jesus counted it joy when he was going to the cross, and he counted it joy because he saw us on the other side of that cross. When we are in trials, when we are in persecutions, what do we do? We look for the joy on the other side, and that's what we go to. We don't sit back and say, oh, man, this is hard. I don't know if I can do this. I'm really unhappy today. Don't we? I mean, you know, we, we whine about the littlest things. How many people do you know that 
are not going to heaven. Then what does it matter if you have some little trial in your life? It doesn't matter. Press on, press through. Let the glory of God show shine within you. That, and people that you pass go, I don't know what's her, what she's doing, but I want some of that. Hallelujah. When you move around, when you go around, when you're on this island, I don't care where you go. You need to affect people. We are living in glory days. These are going to end. They're going to get harder. Who cares? You know when I preach to the ladies, I always put, put on your big girl panties and get on the I try not to preach that where the guys are because they're not going to want to put on big girl panties. But there are some stupid skits. <laughs> Wear them. <laughs> you know. <laughs> the Azusa Street mo movement in 1906 was the birthing of revival. I don't know if you guys really understand how powerful this was. I will give you an idea. In Portland, Oregon, it was started on alcohol and prostitution. But when they started moving in rich people, you know, that because the people were becoming rich and now they had to have class, they made a dividing street. So that side of town was prostitution and alcohol, but this side of town was the classy side. The men that ran this side of town lived on this side of town, but the women never went to that side and vice versa, right? I mean, they had fountains that were filled with beer for the horses to drink. Yeah, this is how this is how Portland, Oregon started. In 1905, the Holy Spirit, some people came up from Azusa, the Holy Spirit fell so hard in Portland that the prostitutes in the windows fell out, were slain in the spirit. They thought they were dead. Were slain in the spirit, woke up, born again, speaking in tongues, and moving forward in the Holy Spirit. Walked away from their lifestyle, became evangelists all over the state. It happened so strongly that people would come into town, and when they would get off their horses, they would get slain in the spirit, wake up repenting, verbally repenting. And for a couple of years, every business in the entire city closed down at 12 o'clock for prayer. And they would open up again at 1. If you came into town, the, the streets shook with people laying on the ground, slain in the spirit. That is how it should be, and that is how it will be again. We are living in the days of Elijah. The Jews had all this wonder going on in their lives for 100 years. That wonder has been multiplied a thousand times for what we're living in. The movement in Wales was birthed in this same time frame. When I'm talking about worldwide, I'm talking about worldwide. So in Wales, there was this birthing, and, 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 and it went burned out all over Europe. I mean, it just kept increasing into World War II. It was just an amazing thing. How about, how many of you have ever heard of the Panyang Yang movement? Korea, 1906. The Holy Spirit, because of a prayer meeting, that the Holy Spirit fell and it birthed the largest church that's ever been created in the world in Seoul, Korea. <coughs> so how did it all start? It was set into motion by the Moravians. Moravians? Moravians. They had a 100-year prayer meeting that sustained all the fires of evangelism in the 1700s into the 1800s. It was a 24-7 prayer watch. 65 years into this prayer vigil, now recognize this is a little bitty church, part of many people. But they felt like God wanted them to pray. So they started. After 65 years, they sent 300 missionaries around the world that planted seeds everywhere they went. Was it all sunshine and roses for them? Of course not. We never have sunshine and roses. Who cares? Make your own sunshine. Grow your own roses. Right? Amen. During the first five years of their existence in this settlement, they had no signs of spiritual power whatsoever. The first five years of their prayer meetings, they didn't see any answers. They had division in the church. It was constant bickering. People left the church. It was, it was just a mess. There's no place for revival in that kind of a mess. And yet what happened? They pressed through. 
They kept looking for the joy on the other side of the problems. And they pressed through. And they continued to pray. And people just showed up 24-7. People would just come to pray. It's my hour. i got to go pray. They put their lives on hold. They got up in the middle of the night. I mean, these are not like you can just get on the internet and do this. They went and prayed. Okay? And what happened? The power of God fell in that place and changed the world. The coldness that the world was in at that time, that religious, you know, gone backwards darkness that was all over Europe, that broke because they were diligent to pray. What else did they set into motion? Well, new lives, spiritual, uh, new spirituality in their life changed an entire country. People would go, what happened to those people that were in that church? Now they're all nice. i got to find out what that is. Do you hide who you are in Christ so that nobody really knows, so that you only tell a select few? Jerry was praying about that last night. Do we only allow our flesh to let us to tell us who we're going to witness to? Or do we let ourselves so shine, so bright that everybody that we pass goes, I don't know what they're talking about. I don't want some of them. I was on a jeepney in the Philippines one time, and this guy got on, and it was way before people had tons of tattoos. He had tattoos everywhere. He had some snake going up the back of his neck. And we had, his head was shaved, except for he had one braid down, which was one of the cults that was there. And he had all these tattoos all over his head around his braid with snakes and dragons and stuff. And I was sitting on the jeepney, just Jennifer and I, my daughter and I. She was 12. And so we're sitting there, and this guy jumps on the back of the jeepney. And as soon as he did, he starts twitching and growling. Sitting there, all humped over. And <laughs> Jennifer goes, the dude's manifesting demons. Okay. The atmosphere around us pressured him. And he jumped off the jeepney and went running. The jeepney driver stopped and yelled at me. I said, I didn't do anything. Jennifer goes, I think he's having the same problem as the other guy. So we got on a different jeepney. Oh, right? Your presence, you should be so filled with the spirit that it affects your atmosphere. Demons don't come into your atmosphere. Your light turns off the darkness. When I went to Circle K today, she goes, are you going to preach today? I am. Are you still having church in the account? No, as a matter of fact, we moved to the window. Oh, man, I have to work today. I can see that. What are you going to preach about? Revival in Guam. What are you going to preach about? How does she even know I preach? How do they know? I don't walk in singing in tongues. Well, sometimes. <laughs> Yesterday I went in and I said, what are, you, what are you struggling with today? And she goes, uh, I said, you have too many customers. I'm just going to go home and pray for you. Please. <coughs> Look for people's hearts. Be in prayer. If you've got things going on in your life, just move it aside, part the curtain, look at the joy. Amen. So what else was set in motion by the Moravians? How about the latter-day rain that went through the U.S. after World War II? Or how about the healing revival? Robertson. How about the generation of great leaders that was taught by Bill Bright? What about 1949, Billy Graham from ministry exploding in L.A.? Where? L.A., just like it all moved from Topeka to out to L.A. How about the college revivals that were started in the 40s? When the background is laid in prayer, there is an overflow of, of the Holy Spirit that moves in. If you jump forward to the Jesus movement or the charismatic movement in the 70s and 80s, it went through the colleges, denominational churches, all through the streets. People turned from drugs and sex to Jesus and the truth in the word of God. Amen. It was an amazing time. Revival continued into the 90s with the Toronto Blessing, the Melbourne Revival, the Modesto Revival, the Brownsville, Brownsville Revival, the Promise Keepers Revival. Now, let's jump back to the days of Elijah. At the end of Solomon's reign, he allowed idolatry through foreign marriages. This was a practice that was specifically forbidden by God. 
How many revivals did I just mention that ended or resulted in the power being drained because of an increase of sin within the movement? I'm going to go to the promise keepers one because it's one of the last, right? It was in the 90s. And um, it became another submission movement that glorified a certain amount of men, made women slaves, and became very oppressive because of sin. It was just another submission movement. And like all sin does, it drained the power out of the revival. So if we go back to Solomon, he leveled excessive taxes. Hmm. Have you heard of this? He uh, had took slave labor to fulfill his own lavish ex uh, extravagances. Have we heard of this? How many pastors have we heard or ministries have we heard that have expanded and the, and the, and the pastors or the leaders have become... Uh, self-centered and selfish and they start drawing and draining all the people so that they can live a lavish lifestyle, right? Once sin begins to grow, it's just like mold. It's really hard to get rid of. And it multiplies rapidly. You put mold in a dark bathroom and let it go, it's going gonna, it's gonna to grow. You know, you got a damp, dark bathroom, you shut a door and walk away. When you come back, it's big. It's big. So Rehoboam, who was Solomon's son, assumed the throne and refuse to count the counsel of older men. So this is another thing that happens in movement of the spirit is the um, leader is there and then the, the next one down, the, the son or whatever takes over, well they have an expectation of the entitlement in power and they aren't interested in what the, the parent, how they struggle and how they pressed into God to get what God was doing they just expect it to be there for them. Um, so Rehoboam did this. He would not receive the counsel of older men. He would. He kept increasing his control. He caused division in the land. He allowed foreign invaders. And isn't that what happens in the spiritual? Isn't that what goes on? Second and third generations live so much on what they were told versus a personal relationship with Christ. Um, the fear of the Lord becomes contempt and then turns to expectation and personal demands. Prophecy from how turns from how to bring the nation to the Lord to how to make more money or make your flesh feel good. Churches teach that there is no warfare needed. The word is used to confirm personal wants and desires. Ahab was an evil king. He came next. He brought witchcraft to Israel. Baal was the chief god worshipped by the Canaanites. Baal is a somatic word meaning lord, master, or owner. The head of this pantheon god of gods was called El. He was believed to be the father of 70 gods. He was the most popular because he was the god of fertility in the human and animal realm, with power over the weather and the ability to bring good crops. Compare that to now. Don't we have pastors that teach us that our whole job is to make more money, have more stuff, to have a bigger house, get a bigger boat, have, a, have more cars. There's nothing wrong with prospering. He said, I desire that you prosper and be in health. Your soul prospers. There's nothing wrong with prospering. When that's your total goal, that's a different story. So, Baalism <coughs> included the worship of deities dedicated to sexual perversion, violence, and greed. This included offerings of incense, burnt sacrifices. Those burnt sacrifices were often human. Um, it also includes sexual licentious, sexual activity was rampant. That means promiscuous and unprincipled. In Jeremiah 7, 9, do you really think that you can steal, murder, commit adultery, lie, and worship Baal and all those new gods of Jeremiah 19.5 The people of Judah stopped worshiping me and made this valley to a place of worship for Baal and other gods that have never helped them or their ancestors or their kings and they have committed murder here burning their young, innocent children as sacrifices to Baal. I've never even thought of telling you to do that. This is the book of Jeremiah. 1 Kings 14 
They built shrines and obelisks and idols on every high hill and under every green tree. There was homosexuality throughout the land, and the people of Judah became as depraved as the heathen nations, which the Lord drove out to make room for his people. This was the land that God sent Elijah into. This was the time that he was sent to. The days of Elijah were actually a time of idolatry, murder, perversion, deception. He was raised up to minister in a time of conflict, political and moral decline, and spiritual apostasy. No matter how evil things got, got in life, God always sends someone at that time. He sends someone who will stand up and speak truth. He sends someone who will bring deliverance. He sends someone who will shine the light in a dark land. <coughs> Has anything changed? America was started with a godly heritage. Most of us have turned away. We see so many turning back now. Right now, there's a shift. Because Christians are actually raising up for the first time in a long time. <coughs> but in the, the turn is really slow. And in many instances, it's very painful for people. you're in a denominational church and you're doing a turn and you and you choose not to walk in the fullness of everything they believe it will be difficult for you still we see the same conditions now in the world that were prevalent in Baalism greed, sex, violence are all glorified people worship the idols of power, money, entertainment and materialism our heroes are sports idols and television stars. They're paid more than teachers, more than firemen, and more than the police. <laughs> Just like in Baalism, America is engaged in child sacrifice <coughs> as thousands of unborn children are aborted annually. We kill them in the womb, in the birth canal, and burn their little broken bodies. If you want to see the reality of this, read the book Gosnell. It'll take a strong stomach and a lot of prayer to get through it. There was one lady yesterday, she, my heart just was like, oh. She was standing out in front of, uh, you know where FHP Vision is over on whatever that road is that's over by me? Huh? San Antonio. San Antonio, what she said. So there was a lady standing out in front. She was a howling, short hair, sun visor, sunglasses. Standing out on the sidewalk all by herself, no one else there, with one little sign, black letters, only about this big, pray abortion in. It, my heart just was like, oh, amen, and we did. As we were going down the road, we prayed for abortion to end again. Jesus foretold all of this in Matthew. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. <coughs> Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. A nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. There's two in Mexico last week, in the last two weeks. All of these things are the beginnings of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated because of me. One of the number one accepted groups to persecute in the world are Christians. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Are you not seeing that? Are you not seeing the churches get smaller and smaller? People are backsliding and they're talking about, they're talking about other Christians for Pete goodness. Find something else to talk about. <coughs> many times false prophets will appear and deceive many people. In Uganda, they almost don't let prophets come anymore because they've had so many falsehoods that have come in and destroyed their churches. They're afraid of prophecy. So what did the enemy do? He brought in false prophets to frighten, and now people are operating in fear instead of faith. <coughs> because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. And I think that when we see wickedness around us, 
I think that it dilutes our faith if we don't really pay attention. And once your faith begins to get diluted, mm -hmm. it's really easy to fall. And the thing is, <coughs> Mike, Mike says this, and I, and I love it. If you are a fish, you don't know you're in water. <coughs> Nowhere do you see a goldfish say, wow, did you notice the water? They just don't. And when we are surrounded by wickedness and sin, it's really easy to let it come into our own life, and we don't even notice. If we are not diligent, we don't pay attention. So Jesus foretold that, but Paul also warned us in 2 Timothy 3. You may well, you may as well know this too. I mean, he's like, whoa, yeah, I might as well tell y'all of it. You ever had anybody that tells you a little bit of something, but they don't really want to tell you the whole thing? And then after they start talking, they well, I might as well tell you the whole thing. Right? Well, hallelujah, you might as well. You may as well know this too, Timothy, that in the last days, it's going to be very difficult to be a Christian. Ouch! For people will love only themselves and their money, and they'll be proud, boastful, sneering at God, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful to them. Thoroughly bad. They will be hard-headed and never give in to others. They will be constant liars and troublemakers and will think nothing of immorality. Ouch. Sounds like the newspaper, huh? They will be rough and cruel and sneer at those who try to be good. How many of you have been mocked for trying to do something that's right? They will betray their friends. They will be hot-headed, puffed up with pride, and prefer good times to worshiping God. How many of you know this is a fact? How many of you woke up this morning and thought, oh, man, I don't know if I want to go to bed. Look at how hard it's going. I can just watch church on TV. <laughs> okay, well, I thought that I'm the pastor. I already have my sermon done, so. <laughs> they will go to church. Yeah. But they won't really believe anything they hear. Don't be taken in by people like that. They're the kind who craftily sneak into other people's homes. Make friendships with silly, sin burdened women and teach them new doctrines. Women of that kind that are forever following new teachers, but they never really understand truth. Peter also warned us. First, Second uh, Peter 3, 3. First, you must realize that in the last days, some people won't think about anything except their own selfish desires, and they'll make fun of you. Truth. Yes? Truth. Oh. <laughs> Heavenly Father, heal him in Jesus' name. The times of Elijah were times of moral, political, and spiritual degeneracy that mirror the conditions in our world in these end times. Elijah entered the arena of spiritual, moral, and political conflict with God-given power and authority and a direct, non-diluted word from the Lord God Jehovah. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob into the similar environment the modern day Elijah <coughs> is into. If we are living in the days of Elijah, it is time for us to stand up and walk in the fullness of the power and the presence of God. We need to take our light into a dark world just like Elijah did. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has a calling on your life. If you are born again, he is calling you. If you're not, we should talk. <laughs> Into this similar environment, the modern day Elijahs have to enter. They need to come in fearlessly. They need to come in power filled with the word of God ever present in their mouths. Don't talk the garbage of the world. Don't talk the negativity of the people around you. Talk about the presence and the power of the Most High God Amen. who sits on a circle of the earth watching. Amen. Amen. Sounds like a new season for revival, doesn't it? Amen. For six years, Mike and I have been, just about six years now, Mike and I have been here praying every Saturday night for revival on the side. We've seen so many things change in the spirit realm, but we're ready to see it in the natural. So let's talk about how does a revival start? Every revival or awakening leaves its own heat signature. In 1740, youth led the way. 
1757, or 1857, businessmen and prayer took center stage. 1906, Azusa Street was interracial revival. I love that. And yet, they all shared a common theme. The most frequently mentioned characteristics of revival and awakenings are, number one, timing. Revivals emerge during times of spiritual and moral decline, which leads to intense prayer. Isn't that what we've been seeing? One of the things that we've been praying for the last five and a half, almost six years, is we want to see corruption revealed in the government. Oh gosh, read the newspaper. We want to see the drugs busted. Oh gosh, read the newspaper. We want to see the prisons cleaned up. Oh gosh, read the front page. Right? And we want the people who have set back and, and been had been affected by addiction, then all these different religion pressed down. We want to see the tomorrow people stand yes. up and yes. take their place yes. and become a living, you, breathing Lord. force of revival in the land. And not only this yes. island, and not only the Marianas, but around the world. Yes. And the vision I had when I first came, one of the very first prayer meetings we had was the island of Guam, right? And this bucket of hot oil up here. It was like this huge thing of hot oil. And I could see it being stirred. And I could see it being stirred. And every little bit, it, a little bit would come out. And it would go down on the island. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. And then I saw it begin to pour out. And it was filled with all these golden flakes. And as it went down over the island of Guam, revival happened. And Amen. Guam was changed. Praise God. Then it went across the ocean and it went up to Korea and it went down over to Southeast Asia and it went across over um, across Russia and around toward Europe and then it went toward America. Amen. But God said, where, Guam is where America starts Amen. her day and it will be where America starts revival. Amen. And it is the season. We do not want the Holy Spirit to say, okay, I'm done working with you people, I'm going somewhere else. Right? So timing. Revivals emerge during times of spiritual and moral decline, which leads to intense prayer. That's been going on. If you'd like to come join us, we're here on Saturday night, 6.30. Prayer puts a longing into the hearts of people to pray for revival. Once you start praying, people start longing for revival and they think it's their idea. That's fine. It could be their idea. We just want revival. Right? <coughs> requires the word. The preaching or the reading of God, God's word brings deep conviction. And it brings a desire and a hunger for Christ. And isn't that what it's about? Isn't that what revival is? A desire and a hunger for more of Christ. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes people to a spiritual death that they cannot achieve on their own. When you take the Holy Spirit out of the church, when you take the Holy Spirit out of your teaching, when you try to put him in a box and contain him, I can tell you for a fact, revival's not coming. <coughs> that shook up Jerome so much, he dropped his phone. <laughs> Conviction. Affected sinners are inconsolable. How many people do you know that want counsel, 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 counsel? There is no hope for them except Jesus Christ. Yeah. It does not matter what. It does not matter what's going on in their life. It does not matter how much you talk. You know, I've got all the psychology classes that you could ever happen to hope for. If you don't have Jesus Christ, you got nothing. The glory has to go to God. God has to receive the praise, the honor, and the glory for bringing the revival. No man does it. No group does it. It is the power of the Holy Ghost and the praise and worship that goes up causes the heavens to open more and even more glory falls. That's what goes on. Reformation and renewal has to come. Revival produces lasting fruit. I am a product of the Jesus movement. Revival will produce lasting fruit. New ministries are founded. Society experiences a reform of morals as more and more people convert. We are seeing that just here on Guam. And it's an awesome thing. Manifestation. Manifestations like fainting, groaning prayer, miracles vary by culture and denomination. Okay? 
But they're going to happen. They're going to happen. And that is just how it is. When the Toronto blessing happened, people were laughing. So, you know, 75% of the church were like, well, that can't be God. They're laughing. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes. I'm not going to put God in a box. He can do whatever he wants. Yes. In Brownsville, people were getting slain in the spirit. They go in the building, get slain in the spirit, and it was just, you know, carpet, wall to wall, carpet of people. You know what? I wasn't in charge of that. Holy Spirit was. Yes. So there's manifestations, and it might not look like you think it should look. Yeah. Don't judge it on what you've been told. Don't judge it on what you've been taught. Look at the Word of God. And if it's not against what God's doing, then hallelujah, let's go with it. Yeah. They can be messy. Revivals cause controversies. They swirl around the miracles. Oh, no, that can't happen. In Uganda in the 70s, T.L. Osborne was there. He raised someone from the dead. Idi Amin said, oh, no, that's not happening. And he ran, began to run the Christians and the ministries out. Moses' grandfather was run out of the country. Uh, Santango Wilson was tortured, caught, and tortured three different times for a month each time. He still started 700 underground churches during that time. But Edie Amin said, oh, no, no, no. We're not having that. I don't know about that miracle. And if I didn't do it, it ain't happened. That's not me. The next thing we know, he's cannibalizing Christians, and he's persecuting and killing Christians. It is mass murder of Christians, and they go underground. Uganda is one of the most godly nations in Africa today. Revival fell. They're messy. There's abuses in revival. There's excesses. The people begin to worship the miracles and the extremes, right? People are suspicious. Theological disputes. That's just a few of the things that happen. That's with the Christians. Not to mention the world. The world looks and goes, wow. Hmm. Wow. Well, I don't want to get caught up in their controversy, so I'm going to walk away. And revivals are cyclical. They come, and they come with all the power, and then men try to take over, men try to take advantage, men try to pull out, men try to make it about them, and they die down. So they press and they decline. So are you an Elijah or not? Are you planted in a world that is just in decay and you're willing to stand up and say, yeah, let it be me, God. Use me, God. I want to walk in your power, God. I want to change the people around me. I want to see every one of my family, every one of my friends saved. I want them all to be in heaven, God. I want to be able to speak a word of comfort in times of distress, in times of, of despair. I want to be able to speak your word with your power, with your communication that changes their life and sets them free. Is that who you are? Is that who you want to be? Are you ready to carry that through? Are you wanting to walk in the anointing and the power that the Lord offers you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would look at every heart here for the ones that are saying, yeah, I want to be your Elijah God. I pray that you would fill them with your power, your presence, and that you would expand who they are in a way yes. that... Everyone around them says, surely, this is God. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.